Hi everybody, welcome to the Chats with Children. I hope you're safe and well and a happy new year to my guest, Fran de Grazio, who is going to carry on talking and part of our series where we're looking at the strategic and parental solutions and the history and future really of sterile pharma packaging since the 80s to now and the future. So Fran, first of all, happy new year. How are you? Well, thank you, and same to you. Happy New Year, and uh, doing well, thanks. I'm glad to hear it. Now, for those people not familiar with Fran, let me just give you a quick background. So Fran is formerly uh, Chief Scientific Officer at West Pharmaceutical Services, but now she's President and Principal Consultant at Strategic Parental Solutions and an Executive Advisor at uh, Kamenax or Kimenox? Have I pronounced that correctly? Kamenox. Kamenox. <laughs> All right, cool. So Fran has, as if you'd seen part one, many, many years of experience within the pharma sector dealing with parental packaging. So she's the ideal person to speak to about this particular topic, given that she's spoken at numerous conferences over the years and still does speak at numerous conferences about this particular topic. So Fran, obviously in part one, um, we spoke about the changes within the marketplace from the 80s to the present day. And viewers, if you missed that, the link to that will be above this video. Now, in this episode, we want to look at actually from the 2000 to now and what has what have been the changes within the marketplace and what have been the key drivers within this space. So I suppose my first question to you is, can you discuss the market and technology dynamics that drove changes in the industry from the early 2000s to now? Sure, sure. I think uh, really probably one of the biggest changes during that time period from a market perspective was the development of biologic drug products. Right. right? I think prior to this point in time, it was really all small molecule. Um, but during this this time period um, is really where biologics came to be. And that drove, I think, a, a lot of improvements and technologies and innovations in the segment. Right. And, and when you say it's driven improvement uh, and technologies in the segment, what have those improvements and technologies been? Sure. Um, with biologics, one of the things that um, came along with that was this thought process around understanding uh, the delivery system more effectively. So it was a move from component thinking to more of understanding a, a system as it's put together. And, and of course, some of the physical aspects of biologic drugs also drove some of these uh, changes and improvements. I think the other, the other piece of this from a market standpoint was the pushing or the, the transitioning to um, risk-based risk thinking from a regulatory standpoint and really the push for improved quality, again, coming from the regulatory agencies. Right. Now, when we talk about biologics and obviously, what changes have there been then in terms of the delivery systems and the medical devices? And where has where have you had to be more careful, I suppose, if you like, in terms of putting those components together? Well, I think one of the biggest changes during this time period was much more movement towards a pre-fillable syringe system. So the movement from using a vial or multi-dose vial application to having a syringe system that's already filled with drug product. Um, that then extends into even further um, combinations such as a syringe in an auto injector for the delivery of a, a biologic. So I think those were really the kinds of uh, technology transitions when you're talking about packaging and delivery systems that were really driven by the biologic materials them, themselves and the fact that they needed to be handled a, a bit differently. Um, the other side of it is also, again, about, about the quality and regulatory changes and things like particles in solution became a huge issue. And again, there were resultant technologies on the packaging side to address those issues. Right. Now, I know um, only last year, Annex One was updated, uh, but that has been in the works for many, many years. So prior to that update, 
would you say that the regulatory requirements have kept up to date with the changes that progressed through the 2000s and the noughties and so on? Well, I think there are some changes that occurred um, proactively on the regulatory and quality side. I think about that really when we talk about uh, risk management, right, and risk-based thinking. So, for instance, quality by design, which is really driving or dri drove the development of drug products a little bit differently. Um, it correlated a bit more to the kinds of development processes that are used for medical devices um, and design controls that are used on that side of the business. Uh, they're all risk-based thought processes. And I think those were really more regulatory driven. I do think that certainly there were other aspects that were driven solely out of the fact that biologics a lot of time are more sensitive to their environment. Right. So due to that fact, there needed to be improvements in certainly some of the quality aspects of the primary containers and components. Right. Okay. And obviously with biologics, you're, you're often talking about smaller batch sizes, et cetera, compared to small molecule, significantly smaller batch sizes, in fact. So as someone who worked within the sector, how much of an impact did that have in terms of reorganizing and restructuring facilities and workflows and processes to take into account these smaller batch sizes that you had to do? Well, I think there's a lot to talk about there because certainly the smaller batch sizes is, you know, definitely a part of the trend, uh, not only during this time period, but I think going forward in the in the future. And, you know, I'm sure we'll we'll discuss personalized medicine. <laughs> we sure in the next know, episode. As sure. we go forward. Um, so those those things certainly have an impact on batch size. Uh, the quality aspects, though, again, uh, one of the biggest changes during this kind of time period, we're talking about over a 20-some you know, year period of time, was the movement to componentry that was already washed and sterilized right. by the supplier. Right? So whether it be a syringe system, whether it be a vial, whether it be an elastomeric component, coming into the pharmaceutical customer, they were already pre-washed, pre-sterilized, and that's really what the industry standard is now. But in the 80s, that wasn't that way. And what really drove that was this movement to higher quality. Right. Okay. And what, from your perspective, is the most significant change made in sterile drug manufacture over this period of time? I think it really is the, the movement towards pre-processed components because Prior to that point in time, every drug manufacturer was processing their own componentry. So everyone was doing it differently versus having a more standardized way across the industry of, of doing it. The other thing is, to the point that you're making around smaller batches, is adaptive manufacturing. The ability to be able to take a piece of filling equipment that, that was used to fill a vial and now have the capability of filling a syringe system and having that kind of flexibility. I think that was another thing that really grew out over this time period. Right. And, and one thing which struck me was that you're talking about obviously these changes, but um, were these changes, I suppose, universal or global or were there still significant differences when you look at what's happening happened in North America compared to Europe, compared to Asia and so on? I over that period, was there some consistency in terms of how, how people worked across those different regions or were there significant differences in how people worked and processed things? Yeah, that's a great question, because one of the things that I've seen through the years is that typically an issue will start in one of the regions, whether it be Asia, Europe or America. And then over time, fundamentally, it crosses the globe. Right, um, we're global. We're global uh, at this point, and so, uh, and a perfect example would be the sensitivity to particles. Right. That was really something that occurred in Japan and in the Asia region, and they were very sensitive to even cosmetic kinds of issues that you could see. 
right? So particulate that you can see. And then over time, of course, particulate became a significant issue, whether you were in Europe, North America, or Asia. Um, so I think that, that these things really occur in one region for whatever re reason, there's more sensitivity to it. But over time, people recognize this is a potential issue and it needs to be addressed globally. Right. And, and what is your view on um, blowfield seal technology in terms of using it for parenteral drugs? I think blowfill seal years ago was thought of as you know, not something that could be used with uh, certain types of products like biologics, but I think a lot of that now um, has really gone by the wayside because of the improvements that have been put in place by the, the people developing these blow fill and seal uh, manufacturing processes. One of the concerns, right, with biologics is always that they're, they're, they can be impacted by heat. And so I think the development of improved processes have shown that that's a potential way that, you know, can offer an alternative for certain biologics or vaccines. Brilliant. Well, uh, would there be anything you'd like to add for this particular period before we finish up on this particular episode, Fran? I think the, the main point to make here is that during this time period, there was a lot of innovation, a lot of technological quality and regulatory innovation, really. And so ultimately, it sets the stage for the future. Fantastic. So, well, look, that, and, and that's a nice little teaser to end with, Fran, because that's what we're going to talk about in the next episode. As the future, we'll maybe start with Annex 1 as well, because that has just come out. That is impacting the future as well. But we're going to talk about that going forward. All right, well, there you go, viewers. So I hope you found that interesting. If you'd like to know more, then you can uh, or have any questions, for Fran, please leave them below the video in the comments. I'm sure Fran will be only too happy to answer any questions you've got. Or you can get in touch with her directly as well. Um, but you can check out episode one. The link will be above the video. And look out for episode three, where we look at the future of parental drugs. Um, in the next episode, so Fran, thank you very much for your time. It's lovely to see you. And I hope you have a fantastic 2023. I nearly said 2022, but I've been 2023. <laughs> so have a fantastic 23. And viewers, I hope you found that interesting. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a fantastic 2023 as well. And until next time, stay well and stay safe. Bye-bye.